So what I'm going to talk about is can we as optometrists help to prevent falls? And it's going to be based on um, some of the research we've done. The stuff uh, that I do with John Buckley from Medical Engineering and uh, Andy Scally, Louise Johnson from uh, the Health Studies uh, at University of Bradford is we have a mobility lab and basically, oh it does work, um, what we do is we have a, this is just part of the lab obviously, it's a big lab, we have 10 cameras, these are infrared cameras, you can just see one there, uh, dotted around the uh, walls of the room and we fix up all our patients who are typically um, elderly, 65 plus patients because uh, that's you know where falls is the major issue and we put these little reflective balls on them in strategic points and we put balls on various things that we want them to step up uh, onto that's just a single step that's a three case staircase there and um, from that and let's see if this video works Oh yes, one, two, three. We can get some really fantastic information about where all those parts, you know, the foot, uh, the heel, the ankle, the, um, the whole leg, where they are as they walk through the lab in 3D space and where they are in relation to steps and stairs, etc., etc. So we can get some fantastic information about gait, um, how we step up and down. And, and stepping uh, up and down is hugely influenced by vision. We really, you know, it's the most important aspect of, in, in terms of our gait, where vision is important, is going up and down stairs. And we also look at balance control. So let's just slip back. I'm going to talk about our own research, but obviously include lots of other people's research as we go along. Uh, first of all, um, falls are common. About a third of all people over 65 fall at least once a year. If you're over 80, you've got a 50% chance of falling at least once a year, and half of those, again, have multiple falls. So falls are very common in older people. They can have dire consequences. They are the leading cause of accidental death in the elderly. They can cause all sorts of fractures, hip fractures, uh, you know, uh, hand fractures, etc., etc., um, bruising, hemorrhages, uh, head injury, etc., etc., um, they are the most common cause also of uh, the reason why people have to go into nursing homes. So they, they can have dire consequences, unfortunately. They are caused by a multitude of factors, but visual impairment is an important risk factor amongst that. Um, the literature is variable, um, partly because a lot of the, uh, the people who do the epidemiological studies don't really know much about vision, frankly. And, um, but at the lowest level, you could say that visual impairment doubles your risk of falling. Some of the studies suggest that other aspects of vision, such as contrasensitivity, visual field, stereopsis, uh, are even more important. So that there's one study, for example, a very important uh, study um, from Ivers and, and colleagues from Australia that show that uh, stereopsis increases your risk, or lack of stereopsis, by six times. So certainly visual impairment is an important risk factor. It's not just visual acuity though, it is those other uh, aspects. And a big point is they are predictable. They are not accidents. So you know, people might feel that falls are accidents, they're not. Um, the literature has been looked at. A, a guy called Tanetti collected all the data together and showed that if you've got one risk factor, for falls, you've got about a 20% chance of falling. If you've got two risk factors, 40%. Three, 60, four, 80, and then it just flattens off. So it's, it's predictable. The more risk factors you have, the more likely you are to fall. So they are not accidents, they are predictable. And importantly, they can be prevented. So what about vision and fall? Concentrate on that. Um, vision is used in balance control. Um, so we have three systems to, to control our balance. You've got vision, you've got your inner ear, vestibular system, and you've got the somatosensory system, so the, the information you get from your feet. Um, I tell the students, uh, it kind of wraps all this up. I don't know if any of you, I'm sure not, have had a few jars on an evening, and you return home, and perhaps you've had a few too many jars, you lay down 
and the, the world starts spinning. Well, this is your vestibular system being affected by alcohol and telling your visual system that the world is going round. What you need to do, I've heard, some people have told me, <laughs> is when you're laying down there and the world's spinning, put a foot on the floor, the somatosensory information kicks in and it stops. Oh, so if you learn nothing else, <laughs> the most useful thing I learned. <laughs> so you're going to have to get drunk to try it, obviously. <laughs> Got to be. Okay, so what is important about vision? Well, there's several aspects. Central vision is important, but peripheral vision is important as well. Um, because of as you move you get optic flow information um, but also eye movements are important so if you sway side to side although the world doesn't move and the world doesn't move because of your vestibular ocular reflex you remember that from undergraduate days that if I for example move my head that way uh, the vestibular ocular reflex will move my eyes the opposite way at the same speed exactly the same speed the opposite direction so the world doesn't move. The problem with that is then you're not getting information about your swaying from your vision. So you have to get it from the eye muscles as they're moving. And so um, things like vertical heterophoria, for example, has been shown to be important for uh, postural control. Uh, and it's because of that, because of the vestibular ocular reflex um, linking in with postural stability. So central vision, peripheral vision, and eye, eye movements are important. So it's, it's involved in the, the building block, if you like, of, of uh, locomotion in, in just pure balance control, standing and dynamic, walking around. But ov obviously it's also used to spot hazards um, and get around obstacles and negotiate steps and stairs. And that's where we do a lot of our research is on the steps and stairs bit. So postural stability is okay, in fact, in bad as 660, if the input from the other two systems is all right. The problem is that if you have a disruption to those two systems, then the vision becomes much more important, and if your vision is poor, that's when bad things occur. So, for example, when what we do in the lab is to disrupt the vestibular system, all you have to do is get people to look up about 45 degrees or down 45 degrees, and that will dis disrupt your, um, your otolinths information and your vestibular information about posture. For somatosensory system, bizarrely, what we do is we get form that they use in slippers and we get people to stand on them and that disrupts the somatosensory information. Uh, because slippers aren't very good, in fact, um, for old people because they're thick and they stop the information coming from... Uh, from the floor through to your feet. So slippers ain't, ain't so good. It also gets worse with an additional cognitive task, and this is common in all sorts of elderly research, with driving, etc. Uh, as you get older, you cannot do multi multitasking. Us men can't do it anyway. So, you know, when we get older, we're dreadful. Um, so, I mean, we got patients, for example, to count up in twos or count back in twos, and it, it really does disrupt their their uh, posture, their uh, balance control. So the clinical implications of that are that your balance is going to be, your vision link to your balance is going to be important in patients with somatosensory problems, so peripheral neuropathy, so therefore diabetics, uh, arthritis, thick sole slippers, or if you've got uh, an inner ear problem, so many as, etc. They, they then are much more reliant on vision. And balance is worse when dual, with dual tasking. So yeah, frail older patients should not chat away when they're descending stairs. Not a good idea. What about with walking? With visual impairment, people walk slower. They reduce the stride length and increase the minimum foot clearance. So you lift your foot up a little bit higher, you slow down, shorter strides. And that goes for all macular degeneration, glaucoma, blur, goes for all of it. That's the, the classic safety strategies used. 
and how we use vision to go around obstacles and up and down stairs, etc., etc., is we view them from two steps away. So I, I'm looking two steps away, and then I'm looking further along. And you're pre-planning. You, it's stored in visual memory where you, where you are, what you're going to do, and it's, it's pre-planned. It's feed-forward system. And then you have peripheral vision, because you're looking two, two steps away. The peripheral vision is used to... Um, fine-tune that so fine-tune where you're going to put your foot where you're going to you know step over the obstacle etc etc you check out when you're going over a, a, a curb next time you'll, you'll notice you check it out two steps away approximately and then it's feed forward and your peripheral vision fine-tunes that um, information so with uh, macular degeneration patients they walk more slowly, as before. They look down more. One thing that we found with AMD patients that seems to be a learnt adaptation is that when they go, well, when a, a normal, normal vision person goes over um, a, an obstacle, they have their toe below their heel. So they go over like that, exaggerated. When a macular degeneration patient, they go slower, Steps are smaller, and they go up like that. So again, exaggerating, but their toe is up rather than down. And that, we think, is because, of course, if you don't know where the step edge is, and you go over like that, and you hit it, you're going to trip. But if you go up like that, and you hit it, you're more likely to stop yourself from tripping. And that's why people go slower as well. Because if you do trip, but you're going slowly, you've got time to save yourself. If you go fast and you trip, you've had it, you're going to fall. So that's part of the reason why slowing down works. And they land more vertically to avoid slipping. So yeah, they come down harder to avoid slipping. With cataract, gait slows down, toe clearances increase. So if you're going on a step, you lift your foot up high to go onto it. And your centre of mass is thrown over more to be over the base of support. So that should be safer. So they're the typical safety strategies for walking and for going up and down stairs. Increased toe clearance, less likely to slip, trip. Slower, so less likely that a trip becomes a fall. So we were, a few years back, we... All this information was saying, these are the safety strategies. And we were just kicking ideas around. And we just thought, falls occur more on the first and last steps of stairs. So could we do something to steps, stairs on steps, to increase their perceived uh, size of those steps? So we thought, well, that's a good idea. So we went to see Professor Whitaker, our... Uh, our esteemed visual illusions expert, and he said, well, yes, there is. And it comes from this, and Dave Whitaker obviously knows lots about fashion, <laughs> and what it says is, forget what Trini and Susanna said, it doesn't make you look fat. <laughs> it's the old vertical stripes makes you look fat. Uh, sorry, horizontal stripes makes you look fat. Vertical stripes supposedly makes you look thin. And it's based on the horizontal vertical illusion. And this is the horizontal vertical illusion. These lines, you won't believe it, but they are exactly the same size. So that vertical line is the same size as that horizontal line. Quite clearly, perceptually, that vertical line is much bigger, looks bigger than the horizontal line. So that's the horizontal vertical illusion. That's where that fashion tips come from. So you're getting tips on what to do when the world spins through alcohol and fashion and we did uh, an experiment where we to be to be quite fair frank we we over complicated things we we put gratings on the top of steps we varied the spatial frequency we used sine wave gratings Dave Whitaker was involved so this is how we did it <laughs> but we did find that it works this step looks bigger than that step they're the same size and pe uh, people lifted the foot up higher to go over that step 
than they did that one. And, well, I'll come on to what we've done since, because that was a few years back. Uh, there is a caveat in that if going slower, lifting your foot up more, um, was all you needed to do, people with poor vision wouldn't, wouldn't trip. Uh, so, as with all things, it's not the whole story. Because going slower and lifting your foot up higher leads to increases in single support time. What single support time is, is that I'm supported on one foot, single support. So that's double support, single support. Obviously, if I'm going slower when I'm get going up a step, and I'm lifting my foot up higher, I'm going to be in single support longer. And of course, single support is the most dangerous part of your, your gait cycle, because that's when you're most likely to, to fall. And that's what we've found. Um, it actually isn't safer if you take too long and you go too high, because what you get are decreases in medial lateral stability. So as you, as you can imagine, as you go up, you're like this, again, exaggerating. And it is well known that older people particularly suffer from sideways falls. And the problem with sideways falls, of course, is hip fractures. So those safety mechanisms are not the whole story. So what we've looked at is we've tried to determine with our little uh, horizontal vertical illusion the optimum parameters that mean that people will lift the foot up higher but won't, it won't be a huge amount of extra time. Uh, and they won't be in single support significantly longer. And we have found the right parameters, in fact, now. Oops. Uh, it's 12 cycles per metre, this one. It works perfectly. Um, people lift the foot up higher there. Don't there. They do on that one. But it's not. It doesn't increase single support time. It's perfectly, seems perfectly safe. In addition, what we've done is we've added, as part of the illusion, that's your horizontal line, and that is actually on the, um, the top of the step. Yeah? So there on the side of the step, the, the step riser, and there on the top, that, that line is on the top. And so that actually is used as a step edge highlighter when you're coming down. So it works for going up and down. And as steps are usually on, uh, sorry, as falls usually occur on the top step, or the bottom step, because that's when vision really is important. Um, actually, yeah, I should go, should go through that. Vision's hugely important on the first step, because you've got to identify the first step, you've got to know where it is, and you've got to put your foot on it, you've got to clear the step edge, and it's really all down to vision. Of course, once you've done that step, you can then use somatosensory information. You can assume that all the steps are the same size, because, well, unless you're, you know, a, some uh, touristic place that uh, where the steps are a different size, but in, in standard buildings they're going to be the same size, and you use somatosensory information. And what happens is your toe clearance as you go upstairs gets less and less, because going upstairs is hard work, uh, particularly if you're, for your elderly. So as an energy conservation strategy, we decrease toe clearance as we go up until we get to the top, and then there's that transition from mid-stair to again the, the landing, and again that's where vision comes in, because you've got to know when the last step is. So vision's really important, top and bottom, and that's where we're putting our illusions, and then we've got a step edge highlighter. And you think, well, step edge highlighters, yeah, but I mean, the, the railway uses them and everybody uses them, they're fine. If you look around, there's stacks that are dreadful. These are from probably the University of Manchester, no, they're not. They're from the, the University of Bradford. <laughs> and if you, this, these are on the Richmond Building's uh, steps. And as you look down, you think, right, there's, well, that's obviously the step edge. That is, that is, that is. Uh, I don't think so. In fact, there's the step edge. It's about an inch from where that big white strip is. And Bradford College have just made loads of uh, new buildings. It looks beautiful. But they've done exactly the same. They've got this huge strip about an inch from the edge of uh, stairs and you will find this relatively common sometimes it's because as as in our uh at the university this is a friction strip and so they're adding friction strips that are useful you know when it's wet uh <laughs> helps you to not slip and 
fall off. But if they're going to use friction strips, for goodness sake, put them on the edge. Uh, other people just use them as to decorate. You know, they look nicer. Yeah, but they're going to make people fall, fall over. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've, we've done the research. It's, it's common sense. If you put it an inch back, people will <laughs> hit the edge. Um, it, it, it's fairly obvious. So, that's some of the stuff we've done. We, with that, um, I mean, we, we, we're hoping to do, go the next step um, and, and put those into real buildings and real stairs and steps and see if they work. Hopefully they will. Let's look, look at some other research. Multifocals, big issue. Um, the big paper was from Lord, an Australian guy called Stephen Lord. He's done a huge amount in the Falls area. Um, and he did a big epidemiological study. So he, he looked at thousands and thousands of people, saw who fell, saw who had bifocal and varifocal wear, saw who had single vision, put it into a fancy statistic package and found that multifocals double the risk of falls. And it's a lot of the stuff from um, multifocals that the falls nurses and falls teams that you've probably heard of or perhaps even come across, um, this is the study they will cite. Um, and it's, a, it's fine. That the, the only issue is, the SLO keep telling me, is <laughs> that the majority of these subjects um, were bifocal wearers because this it was 2002. The data were collected about three years before that, and so around about 80% were bifocal wearers. So it does pertain particularly to bifocals, and they would argue not so much varifocals. Uh, I would disagree, but there you go. There's also uh, some accident research by Davies, and they found the same, that multifocal wearers, and they didn't give, you, give us the, you know, which were bifocal and which were varifocal, but they are at greater risk of falls and underfoot accidents. So there's fairly good epidemiological evidence um, that multifocals will increase falls. In the lab, we've looked at it. What seems to happen is that, and, and we got um, multifocal wearers, bifocal wearers and varifocal wearers who had been wearing their lenses for at least 10 years. And we looked at their gait stepping up and down, one step, two step, etc. Um, oops, sorry. The first thing we found is they don't, they don't flex the head. You know what we teach them? When you first get the very, very focal, tuck your chin in or the bifocal. When you're going up and downstairs, tuck your chin in, look over the top, you'll be nice and clear. They might do that for a week, soon stops. They, um, they don't do it. Um, they certainly didn't do it in the lab. There was no indication that, and other studies have looked, and there's no indication that they, they do flex their head more. They don't increase toe clearance, so they don't use that safety mechanism. Again, it could be an energy conservation thing. Going upstairs is hard work. What we did found is that the precision of toe clearance and foot placement was less. So in other words, they were much more variable in where they put the foot and how much they lifted the, the foot up. Much more variable, variable. And if you think about it, if you've got reduced precision or greater variability of toe clearance with no increased toe clearance, you're going to hit the step more. And that's what they do. There's also less control when stepping down. So that when they step down, because they're not sure, because they're not going to flex the head so much, um, you know, they get close and they think, oh, I'm nearly there. And it's a free fall, the last bit. So it's not controlled. When you've got single vision lenses, you can see where you are. It's a nice controlled, soft landing. With a, with a bifocal or varifocal, it's soft to there. And then, because they're not sure, they just look free fall. So there's not so much control, more hits, because they're not sure where the edge of the step is, they're not sure where the floor is. Um, and single vision lenses improve all these factors in adapted multifocal wearers. Now, when you're doing research, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's various levels of hierarchy. And at the bottom, it's experts. Don't listen to experts. They're the worst kind of evidence. They're at the bottom. Then you've got your, your studies, case control studies, epidemiological studies, etc., etc., lab-based studies, and it builds up, and at the top are randomised control trials. So a randomised control trial is where you get 
Usually in, in these sort of studies, the typical number is 300. 300 people get the intervention, whatever that might be, and 300 are left to their own devices, the control group. And you compare the falls rate in those two groups. And they have done a randomised control trial with um, multifocals. And it was done by, again, another Australian group. A lot of the research is done by the Aussies, Stephen Lord and his crew. And th what they did was they gave um, multifocal wearers who were well adapted. Um, they said to them, right, you need, when you go outside, other than shopping, you must wear distance vision, single vision lenses. And um, obviously they wear the normal varifocals at any other time, but when they're going out, that's what they have to do, except for shopping. And the control group were left to their own devices. Um, they found it very difficult to recruit. They found it very difficult to keep people in the study. Pe people didn't like it. But they did it. But the evidence is not straightforward. And I must admit, I'd, from some of the feedback I've had from falls teams and falls nurses, falls teams and falls nurses seem to think it is straightforward and seem to think that multifocals are bad for everybody. And if anybody's in multifocals and they have a fall, they should be taken out. That's not the case. It, 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 the, the study was not straightforward at all. And if you looked at everybody together, there was no difference in falls. But they had a pre-planned, and you must pre-plan it, not just do it afterwards and cherry pick, but they had a pre-planned strategy that they were going to look at people who were fit and people who were not fit. And then they found a difference. The people who were fit and active and got outside a lot, more than, say, three times a week, they fell less with intervention. So giving them single vision lenses worked. They fell less. People who were unfit didn't get out much. They fell more with the intervention. So giving everybody who wears multifocal single vision distance lenses is not a good idea. Because if they don't get out much, you're going to make them fall more. And, and that is not what a lot of uh, falls teams oops, sorry, seem to think. So you have to be careful. Why is that? And I must admit, I scratched my head for a long, long time over that and didn't get an answer. Uh, but then spotted uh, a, a very recent paper by an American team. And what they've found is they looked at reaction times of all elderly people in varifocals against single vision lenses. And they found that those who were wearing varifocals, reaction time for grabbing something was quicker and grabbing it and ha hanging on to it. And what they hypothesised, and it seems reasonable, is that if you're unfit, you are much more likely to fall anyway, in the home, outside the home. In the home, particularly, if you're going to fall, you're going to want to grab a rail, because rails are really useful to stop you, you know, a trip from going into a fall. And the, the varifocal, the multifocal, helps you in that, because you can see it, and you can target it, and you can grab it. And maybe that's why. It's a hypothesis only. I don't know, but it seems, at least it's a hypothesis. They've got an idea of why, maybe, this, this, this occurred. Um, so what does it mean? Well, it means that regular multifocal wearers who are active and fall into an at-risk group, you know, they, they have a fall. That means they're more at risk. They develop diabetes. You know, they get arthritis in the leg, whatever. Uh, they, they get on sedatives, more medication. Whatever puts them into an at-risk group, they should be advised distance feet, single vision lenses when walking outside. Um, we are, with Essilor, <laughs> looking at another idea, which I, I think actually might work quite nicely, is, is if you have um, an elderly person who is at, uh, at risk of falls, I, I think that a, 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 a neat idea might actually, to keep them in a, in a, in a progressive, keep them in a very focal, but give them an intermediate ad for everyday use. So the intermediate ad, when you go out, you can do your shopping, probably. You can probably manage with your menu. You can do all, you can look at your time. You can do all those things. You can probably manage. And then you have the readers. So it's a different strategy to usual. And that's, a, that's something we're looking at. We're, we're, we're doing some studies on that and seeing if that works. Again, we don't know. The big problem with this, as I said, is the Haran study had a hell of a job trying to recruit for this study. 
and they found it really difficult because people don't like, they like the multifocals, they like the bifocal, they like the very focal, they don't want to swap, no matter how much you tell them. So it is, um, it is a difficult one, but the evidence is there uh, that if they are active and, and uh, they're in an at-risk group, you should be advising it at least. If they don't want to take that advice, that's fine. But I think the advice has to be given. And certainly that's what false teams are going to be doing. Uh, and they may be stronger in that advice than, than, than perhaps they should be. Okay, so we, we've, we've come on to RCTs, randomised controlled trials, and um, it is worth just reviewing them a little bit because I'm sure you've all heard of NICE guidelines. NICE guidelines are the government guidelines that they use to review the research evidence and say whether you know, some intervention uh, will be paid for by the NHS. And the NICE guidelines do not currently highlight the usefulness of optometric intervention. Um, we, we, we have just got in, I mean the college are doing a very, very good job with, uh, with FOS, I must say. Um, and due to the college, we have got um, visual impairment as a risk factor now. It wasn't even a risk factor in the, in the NICE uh, guidance uh, before the, last year. Uh, it is now in, but the reason, I think it's useful to know why optometric intervention isn't in there, clearly um, visual impairment causes falls, there's loads and loads of people, elderly people, who have out of date glasses, surely if we just give them up to date glasses they're going to fall less, well we'll come on to that, but the studies that the NICE guidelines were looking at, the big study was the Day and colleagues study, published in the British Medical Journal, um, this was an RCT of a lot of interventions, including an optometric visit. The problem with RCTs is they're not so fantastic. Yeah, they're the top of the pyramid, but that doesn't mean they're not, per you know, they, they, they're perfect. They're not. Because, for ethical reasons, all RCT participants must be told what the study's about. This is about whether new glasses will help you fall less. Okay, I've got that. Thank you. The control subjects must also be allowed their usual care. You go on and do whatever you'd normally do. Oh, so getting new glasses makes you fall less. Ooh, I think I might pop and see my optometrist. And that's the problem. You leave them to their usual care. You hope they will, you know, abide by that and have their usual care. A lot of them don't. And, well, you know, you can understand. And so... <laughs> It's relatively easy for subjects to obtain getting new glasses. And so in the day intervention study, the control group, the one left to the usual care, had better VA at the end of the study. <laughs> so that really works. So, yeah, RCTs may not be the be all and end all. But there's something else there. It's not just this RCT thing. There's, there's something odd going on. And if you look at the studies that have looked at cataract surgery in falls, there's limited improvements, which is odd. Again, you know, all that visual impairment due to cataract, surely if you got rid of it, they're going to fall less. Doesn't, doesn't happen that way. Uh, in the Harwood study, they looked at um, first eye surgery against, they just sped up the surgery. They, they let them have surgery within a week compared to the normal weight. That was the control group. Um, and the falls rate did not change if they looked at everybody. They looked at recurrent falls, those people who had felt twice or more, and then there was a small benefit. The McGuinn study, American study, no benefit. FOSS, a British study, second eye surgery, no benefit. Oh, that's odd. So very little benefit, none, none. And there's also recent studies actually looking at um, accident and emergency uh, visits by people who've had cataract surgery in, from Australia, thousands of, of numbers, and they've very, very recently published, um, showed that actually people who've had surgery have more accidents. And so there's clearly something going on. Cataract surgery doesn't have, other than perhaps first eye, the improvement you'd, you'd think. Why? Well, I think the answer is probably in this study, this is a, 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 a Roger Cumming, another one of Lord's group, big Australian study. It was an optometric intervention study. 300 went to see their optometrist, got new glasses, got referred, got ev whatever they wanted. 300 were left to their usual care, whatever that means. And obviously the hypothesis was you get new glasses, you fall less. What happened? 
you get new glasses, you fall more. Oh dear. The absolute opposite to what you would expect. So visually impaired should fall over more. Get new glasses should fall over less. Uh -uh. Doesn't happen. Uh, and this was a significant finding for both fractures and for reported falls. So why? What's going on? Oh, and at this point I thought I'd, I'd bring in some money because I thought there might be some Bradford students and they'd be disappointed if I didn't bring in a little money. The other thing about money, <laughs> there is, there is a, a very tenuous link, um, is that as well as being a superb painter, he painted the same things over and over again and he also had cataract. So this, he, he built a garden in, in France, Giverny in France, and he loved Japanese stuff. And this is his Japanese bridge in his garden in, in France. Um, this was painted when he was about 60, 62, something like that. And the next painting I'm going to show you is exactly the same Japanese bridge, painted when he was 82, and he had cataract by that stage, and his visual acuities were no light perception in one eye and 660 in the other. So Moni was blind. And there is his Japanese bridge. And as you can see, the resolution's down a bit. And the other thing is he, well, I, we hypothesized that he has nuclear cataract because of course all his blue's gone and he's painted much more reds and yellows. And he does complain about the incredible increase in blue subsequent to his surgery because he does have cataract surgery. The other great thing about uh, Monet is that all his letters and correspondence has been all packaged together by a guy called Daniel Wildenstein and uh, you can get access to it. So the tenuous link <laughs> is that Monet, post cataract surgery, had this RX. Oh, yucky, yucky. 618 minus four sills plus tens. Anybody remember those old days of the affair kicks? <laughs> and the comments, this is, this is Monet with his broad brim hat, which he wore to protect him from the glare because of his cataracts. This is his doctor, Clemenceau. Uh, the distortion and exaggerated colours, distortion, minus four sill, never had one, I could imagine. Exaggerated colours that I see, he hated the blue are quite terrifying. As for going out for a walk in these spectacles, it is out of the question for the moment. So there's the tenuous link. Monet with his plus tens, minus fours, couldn't go out for a walk. Um, and that is the thing about glasses. Yes, they improve your vision, but that's not the only thing, of course. The other big thing is magnification and distortion. So the distortion you're gonna get from your sill your magnification you're going to get from your sphere. And if you have that much, you probably won't go out for a walk. The problem is that people with much less amounts of magnification and distortion will go out for a walk, but quite clearly are putting themselves at risk by doing so. So in the coming study, in that big Australian randomised controlled trial, what they said was, well, why, why is it? And there's two main uh, hypotheses. One is, they got new glasses, they went out more, they fell more. That's possible, but there's no evidence for it. What there is evidence for is that they looked at who had big RX changes, and by big, they don't really mean big. They mean over 075 diopters of sphere or sill. 74% of those fell, compared to 52% who had less than 075. So if you had a big change, almost three quarters chance of falling, only half the chance if you had a smaller change. And 50% was what the control group was. And 50% is what it was before surgery. So the change is all to do due to those. Anybody with over, over 0.75 fell more. So why? Well, magnification clearly is an issue. It can make steps look bigger or smaller. It can make steps look closer or further away. So we've looked at this. And what we thought was, well, let's blur people and we'll blur them at the same level from two steps away because that's where we, we look at steps on stairs and decide where we're going to put our feet. So we blur them at the same level from two steps away with a plus two and a minus two and a plus one and a minus one and the control. And we said, right, well, if... 
If they're blurred, it's going to, the step edge is going to be, hmm, not so sure where that is. So they're going to lift the foot up. And the more blurred they are, the more they should lift the foot up. So we said, well, if it goes with a safety mechanism, that's where the data is going to look like. It's going to go up with 2D, a bit less with 1, up with 1D, a bit, a bit more with 2D. That's not what we found. So that's the hypothesis. If it was a safety strategy, this is what we found. And so with 1D, the stepped, the toe clearance was less than control. With 2, it was even more less. So in other words, the gate, despite it being blurry, despite not knowing where it was, was not driven by that safety mechanism. It was driven by magnification. And so they thought the step was further away, and they thought it was smaller, and they changed their step accordingly. And, and of course, when you think about it, well, when you're going up and down stairs, because of that energy conservation system, you really do fl go really close to edges. You know, you, there's lots of these older patients were getting within f five millimetres. They're really close and hitting it now and again. So, you know, it's very precise. And because of the energy conservation, we're making it, as we go down, less and less. So those slight changes do matter. So it likely affects gate safety on steps and stairs. Magnification also can change the gain of the VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex. So remember the, the VOR, when you're walking along, I'll do it the other way around this time. If I move my head down, the world doesn't float up because my eyes move up at exactly the same speed so that the world doesn't move. Now, of course, when you get new glasses, and let's say you get uh, a magnification, when you move your head, it's going to move over a smaller amount because of the magnification of the image. And so you're going to get swimming because those two are now not linked because of that magnification. The VOR gain doesn't fit because of the mag of the specs. So the world will swim. And that's what patients complain about. And of course, the bigger the mag, the bigger the, um, the discrepancy in the vestibular ocular reflex gain, the bigger the symptoms of swimming. So we are, we are well, we've, we've just finished a study post-cataract surgery, looking at, um, you know, because we're talking about 075 being big and therefore causing falls, perhaps, uh, changing that. What about these people who, who go from a minus six to zip? And then the ophthalmologists say, whoa, look what we're doing for you. No glasses. Well, yeah, but you might be falling over a bit more. <laughs> um, it's not as big as we thought, because you would have thought, you know, if 075 increases it that much, surely six day octas, ooh, doesn't seem to. Um, but it's certainly there. It's certainly a factor. It's a significant factor in our statistical analysis, as is astigmatism, as is anisometropia, as is visual acuity. So lots of things combined, but certainly uh, those big changes post cataract surgery come with a risk because the magnification does change and there is an increased risk of falls. We found exactly the same. No change falls before and after cataract surgery. None at all. Um, with specs, I think you've got to follow the evidence. The evidence is that anything over 075 increases your risk of falling. And so ideally, if we can, you should limit the amount of change you give to all the people at risk of falls. Uh, astigmatic changes, Clearly, well, we all know this, if you give somebody a big change in astigmatism, things slope. The floors slope, the walls slope, stairs slope. And that's what we found. And when we got people, we give people oblique sills uh, over the top of the glasses, and as well as lifting their foot up higher, they also shifted off to the side of this, where the slope was lowest. One lady, I remember, went like this, and then went boom, and missed the step altogether. Um, so these perceptual changes are, are pretty dramatic. So with astigmatism, as well as moving uh, vertically, there's movement laterally because of the slope. Um, and again, conservative prescribing of astigmatic changes are advised. We did a study, a college study, uh, looking at who does partial prescribing. And it was quite interesting um, because what we found is there was a huge link with how much, well, how long you've been practicing. 
So if, for those newbies, nah, don't bother with parcel prescribing. My refraction's dead good. Uh, as you get older and older, you realize, well, maybe not. <laughs> and you partial prescribe uh, much, much more. Um, conservative prescribing seems to be the best way to go. So, um, last slide. You'll be glad to know. You can go home. Have those beers. You can help prevent falls in your older patients who are at risk of falls. First of all, you need to identify older patients who, who are at increased risk. So, you know, these are people with diabetes, with Parkinson's, after a stroke, who are frail, um, who are on sedatives, who have polypharmacy, more than four medications a day. One thing that you could add when your patients are 75 plus into your case history is have you had a fall in the last year? Because a history of falls is a very strong predictor of falling again. So if somebody has a history of falls, that's a risk factor for falls, that's one. So that's a good question to add to your case history. You can expedite cataract surgery, but the evidence is really only there and it's slim for first dive. And that's, and, and to, um, the NHS is using that in some areas, I don't know whether it's true here, but they are in some areas to um, scrap second eye or give lots and lots of you know, uh, other uh, things that you have to pass before you get second eye. Second eye is becoming uh, rationed again, it would seem, in some parts of the country. I don't know, is it, is it here? No? Oh, okay, that's good. It is in some areas. And some of them are using that FOSS study as, as, uh, as, as evidence of why, because it doesn't improve falls, they reckon. Um, do not prescribe first-time multifocals to at-risk patients. If, if somebody's got to 65, 70, and they've never won bifocals or varifocals, just leave them. You know, if they're at risk of falls, giving them bifocals or varifocals at that time is, is not a good idea at all. Do not prescribe them. Leave them to, you know... The, the, the two pair or the one pair or whatever they're used to is fine. Don't, don't change things. Um, the evidence is that if you've got an active multifocal wearer, they're going out more than, say, three times a week, um, prescribe single vision glasses for outdoor use on top of their varifocal or bifocal. So that's an additional pair to walk out and about outside with. Um, actually, there was another... The, the, the Haram study, despite being published in the, the British Medical Journal, just did have a, a few um, problems. One of the things they're doing now with randomised controlled trials is they're getting you to publish the methodology first so you can't fiddle it afterwards. And it's a really good thing. And it works in this study. Because if you look at their methodology paper, published in a much lesser journal, it, it's, it didn't say anything about um, tints or reactolites. Yet, when you read the Haran final paper, they were all given tints. So these single vision distance pair weren't just single vision lenses, they were tinted. So you don't really know whether it was the single vision, because they were out in Australia, lots of lovely sun, uh, or actually, and or the tint. So, yeah, a bit dodgy in, in some respects. But I think the evidence, and certainly the evidence that false teams are using, is, and the best evidence available, given all the literature, is this. If they're active, they're going out a lot, suggest single vision lenses on top of the varifocals. Do prescribe conservatively. Try and limit it to 075 if you possibly can and if it makes sense. Obviously, there's lots of other thing, issues you have to consider, driving, etc., etc., whether they'll pay for it, whatever. Um, but again, the advice to give is that if you do go too far, it can be hard to adapt to, and it does increase the risk of falls. Um, if you do go for big changes, or even if they're you know, relatively small, do give advice. Clearly, we always give advice about adaptation. I think it's useful to give them advice about magnification effects. If you have a, a minor shift, it's going to make things smaller. It's going to make steps further away and smaller. If you give a, a plus shift, it's the opposite. If you give an astigmatic shift, it's going to distort things and make things sloping. Uh, so do give them that information. And that's me. Thank you very much.